Port Game Day podcast is a weekly preview of Port Adelaide's AFL action. Make us part of your game day routine and tune in as you get ready to cheer on the power. Welcome back to the Port Game Day podcast coming to you on the Port Fan Radio Network. I'm your host, John, and I'm stuck on 47 games in the Div 6 Reserves. Joining us as usual, Mum wants me to come up with a better intro for him. It's friendly Andrew. Okay, yeah, John, how's it going? Yeah, I'm not too bad. And uh, we're back. We're back on deck with all three of us. Uh, we've got the shadowy figure from the Adelaide hip hop scene and former winner of KFC's Kicking for Chicken. Good day, Jimmy. Good day, boys. Good to be with you. And yeah, I almost didn't make it tonight. The old uh, the wisdom teeth were giving me troubles, but I'm here. Uh, sedated, so let's go. <laughs> Absolutely. Well done under the duress. You're giving the people what they want. And uh, we noted with interest at last week's game that the, there was the uh, the kicking for cash at, uh, was that half time? Um, there was like, they had like the bins lined up the, with the guy kicking from outside 50. And if you hit the, if you land the ball in the bin uh, in the goal square, you get $100,000. Is that correct, Andrew? Was that the. I think so, yeah. The deal. So, Jimmy, uh, I mean, you've put it in a, you've, you've put, it, nailed a drop punt into a uh, inflatable uh, KFC chicken bucket before. Um, maybe it's time to have a crack at the uh, the wheelie bin. Yeah, like let's do it. I mean, I've got a trusty left foot. I'd back myself in to do it maybe one in a hundred times. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, I mean, it, it might not be your. Your day, but it might be your moment. You know, if you just stick to your structures and uh, you know go in harder and stronger, maybe you'll come out with the hundred k. Well, guys, let's talk. Let's talk turkey. Uh, I mean, following an eventful showdown, forty two loss, uh, we travel over to the former Manuka Oval, which is now known as the University of New South Wales Canberra Oval. Um, Go figure. Uh, and we're taking on the Greater Western Sydney Giants in Saturday Twilight Footy. Uh, the Giants bounce back from their round one loss, uh, and they're beginning to find their footing uh, back as the pre, you know, um, capturing their preseason premiership favourite status. They're sitting fifth on the ladder with two wins and a loss. Uh, they're trailing the fourth ranked power on percentage only. Uh, change to the sides this week. See Jonathan Patton and Matthew Kennedy coming to the GWS side with Stevie J, Steve Johnson and Ryan Griffin succumbing to injuries. Whereas the power of Optive for Speed with Jasper Pittard and Matthew White playing their first games for the season with uh, the suspended Paddy Ryder and omitted Brett Eddy making way. So obviously, guys, those changes have some pretty, uh, some pretty big significance as to the structure of the sides as they head into this one and thus perhaps how the game will, will be played. So... How do we see those changes and uh, the impact on, I suppose, what we expect to see on Saturday afternoon? Yeah, it's a bit of a uh, it's a bit of a it's reversion to uh, to last year's uh, approach of, of going in a little bit short and, and trying to play for for speed. Uh, not sure I'm a hundred percent of a fan of it, but I do notice tonight that Logan Austin and Aiden Johnson have been held out. Uh, of um, the Magpies games, apparently going mm. to Canberra. So I look forward to uh, Aiden Johnson coming in, playing some half back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I saw that as well. I, made, I had that in my notes for Logan Austin uh, being named first emergency, and obviously that would enable, uh, I guess, you know, someone like a Rory Lobb to be covered pretty easily, and Jacko can then go about his business in ruck. So. I mean, Logan Austin's a, a Canberra product as well, is he not? Or at least um, from the OCT. So that'd be good if he could get a game. Yeah, exactly. I'm the same. I saw that on the team's on the team's name. It's the first emergency, and I thought hmm, maybe he might come in. And as soon as you mentioned uh, he he sat out of the game tonight, I think that may be a likely move. And I think it it would be a good move because they do have a lot of height down there and. We really need to cover uh, Jacko if he's rucking. And with those tools, oh, I'd like to see him come in and play. Yeah, no, I mean, as we as we kind of said, I, um, with those players, Jasper Pittard and Matthew White, we are, I guess, opting for pace and uh, perhaps going with a more mobile outfit over the, 
you know, over the ground and perhaps with a bit of uh, that forward pressure and p- pressure on the ball as, a, as like trying to gain a competitive advantage in that way, which um, I don't mind, uh, you know, having a, I guess, what a distinct game plan based on your personnel and uh, trying to base something around there. At least it's an ethos. Um, so, you know, obviously we, we like to see the, the big guys in there and we like to see the matchups uh, line up on paper and, you know, it's good to see we've got everyone covered at least for size. But uh, I, I actually, I actually like, if you look at our mid, mid-size and small-size players, we, we bat very deep this week and uh, the GWS have, have got a few injuries at the moment with Stevie J, Griffin, Canelio, Delidio, Whitfield and uh, Mzungu all on the pine. So it's possible that we're trying to stretch them and maybe even beat them at their own game. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know, talk about Austin playing like it's guaranteed, but I think the the Matt White inclusion was was a, a move to make us a bit quicker in the forward half. But you look at the back half, Austin would be a perfect matchup for a Rory Lobb. You know, we lose Jack Homsch, we replace him with Trangove in the back lines. Then we lose Paddy Ryder and place him with Trangove in the ruck. We're one tall down. So for him to come back in would be, in my opinion, the best the best way to go. And then in the fourth half, we, we gain another runner in Matty White uh, with, with obviously Brett Eddy coming out the team. So that makes sense. And if they bring in Austin, that would be that would make sense as well. I think the, uh, the, the issue is I agree that you, you go through the matchups and you do it sort of as if everyone plays one on one, and that's not really how the the game's played these days. Uh, but we still seem at the way that the uh, the first twenty two is picked that we're that we are one short in the back lines to just even cover them uh, appropriately with Rory Lobb and, and Jonathan Patton, because I'm assuming that Jonas will go to Cameron as he has um, pretty typically. Has I mean, he, the issue has he from memory. I'm just trying to remember. Tom Jones I mean, definitely. Yeah. I would have thought Jack Homsch has played on him a fair bit when he's in the side. And I, I'm, if I might be mistaken here, and sorry to butt in, but I can we've lined Jasper Pitt up against him previously as well. Like I can, Cameron is almost someone that you can play one of those 190 centimetre guys against. Yeah, Tom Jones definitely. Um, maybe before Homsch came into the team, um, but he certainly, uh, I certainly remember him following you around um, uh, at, at points. But I guess what you've you, what you've opened up is is the conversation and the issue that um, we had last week is that it actually wasn't pack marking in the forward lines that we struggled with. It was the leading up uh, and not playing close enough and not putting enough pressure on Walker and Lynch uh, at, cr- at critical parts of the game. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily these sort of pack marks or one out marks that killed us. Uh, it was it was something that you would anticipate someone like Tom Cleary um, or any of our other medium defenders should have been able to deal with. Yeah, I mean that was the thing, wasn't it? We definitely we just fell down at the wrong times. We uh, we kind of uh, mucked up certain contests mm. and things like that. Going back to that one on one stuff, I mean we didn't really get caught out in that one on one last week. You're right, the, the lead up is what done us. But we actually have won 25 out of our 68 defensive one-on-one contests, which is number one. So when we are getting caught out one-on-one, we're actually the best team in the competition. So it's an interesting fact. I mean, the defence has held up pretty well so far this year. I reckon uh, Nathan Bassett's obviously got them playing pretty well. And it's that that team defence aspect where we're trying to send multiple players to each contest. It's just... Yeah, I mean, um, we'll obviously talk about it throughout this podcast, but um, it's just it's just mistakes at crucial moments that like other team, quality teams will punish us for. And we and just last week, I mean, we've had a good start to the season. Let's not um, forget about that. Um, the Crows were just able to make the most of their opportunities, and I guess in GWS you have a you have a team that um, is able to do that as well. They've got a lot of uh, quality on the on the park. Um, notwithstanding the fact they're missing some some good players as well, they're blessed with some serious depth. Um, there's some, there's some pretty there's some very dangerous players on, you know, on every line for them. I guess uh, I mean 
I think we've probably spoken, started speaking about it already, so we might delve into those matchups a bit more um, at this point in time. So um, I guess how, how do we see us covering their, their big forward line? Uh, obviously, they bring Jonathan Patton back into the side this week and we've spoken about Jeremy Cameron. Um, I mean, it's, I guess it's hard to say. We're speculating that Austin, Logan Austin might come in. Um, do we have those bigs covered, or is it is it the actually the uh, the mediums and smalls that we're worried about for GWS? Well, I mean, you know, you look at the matchups, and again, we don't really get caught out in those one on ones too often. But the likely matchup, if Austin wouldn't, wasn't to play, would be, I guess, someone's going to have to stand taller against Lob. So you're looking at maybe a Cleary, but I'd like Cleary to go to Patton and Tom Tommy Jonas to take Jeremy Cameron. Uh, if if Austin comes in, that would be the the likely matchup for for Lob, but if he doesn't, then we're looking at you know a a shuffle around and then maybe asking a a Dan Houston or a, a Jasper Pittard to play against uh, Jeremy Cameron. So the smalls are probably where they're where we have to worry about, and um obviously yeah, the whole the whole forward lines looking looking pretty dangerous on paper. Yeah, I agree with those matchups. Um, I don't... I don't think I don't think it's an obvious answer. I mean, the one thing I do think about is uh, we played Hamish Hartlett on uh, McGovern yeah. last week um, to pretty good success, I thought. No, I didn't think McGovern had any sort of influence on the game and obviously ended up uh, on the pine, uh, and we survived that match up. Uh, but the option, the, I guess, the position we're left with is a, is it sort of, it's sort of a choice between Rory Lobb and Jonathan Patton if we go in as named without Logan Austin coming in. Uh, and I'd probably prefer a natural defender to go to Rory Lobb and then put someone on Jonathan Patton because he just doesn't seem quite as dangerous uh, as Rory Lobb could be working mm. up and down the ground. So, And Rory Lobb is, is uh, I believe he was the number one contested marker in the AFL last year. Yep. So, yeah, but saying that, he didn't really get off the leash when we played him at Amy, uh, Adelaide Oval um, last last time we played him. I don't I think he was pretty ineffective when you look at his stats. He definitely got off the leash when we played him in Canberra the first game. And, yeah, he was a beast, taking massive, massive marks, splitting packs and looking like a force. But I reckon that game that he didn't get off, and I'm just looking up the... Um, trying to find the uh, um, the website to confirm it. But I reckon by the time we played them again... Mm, Matty um, Lobby was back in the team. And Jackson Trengove, I reckon, might have dropped back into defence to play on him in that game. And I reckon Trengove's a great... He's actually a really good matchup for um, for Rory Lobb. Uh, both pretty sort of uh, gangly, um, gets his body into him, makes it really hard. I think that's what Rory Lobb really doesn't... He doesn't sort of particularly like... He doesn't mind engaging in body contact himself, but he doesn't really like... Um, someone putting a body on him. Um, but we're obviously going to be down that option this time. Um, so whilst he didn't have an impact last time, I think it's because we had a different matchup. Yeah, but from memory, we didn't have Jack Homsch and Tom Jonas last game. I think we were rolling with Trengove, maybe Austin. And um, oh, I can't remember now. But yeah, it's an interesting setup this time around. Cleary, yeah, Cleary. So, um, but yeah, it's just... I think the, the smalls are just as dangerous as well, and Toby Green has been rated as a top two small forward in the competition. So he's he he actually got off the leash against the Crows just in that first quarter, wasn't able to convert his opportunity. So he's definitely a danger. Yeah, and he's just like he's oh, he's an interesting player because he he still looks like he's fifteen years old, and yeah, he's I mean. He's got a decent physique, but he's got that kind of childlike face, and he just um, he uses his body well in contests against those like the small defender matchups that he gets, and he he just kicks goals for fun, really. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a seriously dangerous player, and uh, someone obviously that we need to to clamp down on. So, I mean, do we have a direct matchup for him? Uh, I mean, we're surprised, you know, Darcy Byrne Jones. Is an option, I suppose, and Jonas will probably be occupied last uh, elsewhere after you know he he played on a smaller player last week. So interesting to see how they, they look to cover that one. Uh, yeah, like, as I've said, I think I've mentioned to this point. Like I'm I'm 
uh, I'm a bit of a rap or a believer in you can play a medium tall against Jeremy Cameron and maybe you play a medium against Toby Green so you can perhaps get some aerial dominance, dominance against him, like a Dan Houston, possibly. Yeah, I don't mind that much. I, I prefer DBJ to, to have first crack. I think we can safely say he's our number one lockdown small defender and um, give him a shot. You know, he's, he's that type of player that needs a challenge and when he has a challenge, can back himself in and and really take the game by the scruff of the neck and, and he's really been one of the shining lights down there and hopefully he can get the job done on the weekend. Yeah, it is just me though because like, Green's a pretty similar player to Eddie Betts and they weren't, they weren't comfortable, comfortable with giving him the matchup last week. Uh, I mean, you've got Devin Smith to worry about as well who's a bit of a handful, so... He'll probably end up playing on one of those two guys. Okay, so <laughs> up forward for us. Uh, obviously, we go in um, without Brett Eddy this week. He um, he's probably had two two poor games out of his three and hasn't quite clicked for him yet at AFL level. Um, so Justin Westhoff has been named in the forward line, so it'll be interesting to see how much time he actually spends up there. Um, but obviously, I think a small medium forwards, you, you bring in Matthew White and you're complimenting uh, Chad Wingard, Carl Amon, Aaron Young and these guys. And uh, we've got a pretty um, pretty like intimidating kind of small forward outfit um, that GWS will have to uh, deal with. Yeah, I think um, I agree that Brett Eddy's played two bad games. The other thing that I would say is I mean, he's hardly got near it and when he has, he's not really played like a key forward. Mm. Uh, and whilst he's occupying a def- a tall defender, uh, I guess if you get, you've either got the choice of playing an out of form tall just to have a bloke run around there for fifty five or sixty percent of the game time, whatever he's playing, or you try and make some sort of advantage out of it. And I think that's basically where we've come to. Um, I, th- I think the only disappointing thing there is is what I mentioned to you at the uh, at the game. Um, last week, John, which which is, I think, the only way he's going to... I think he's really struggling with the pace of uh, AFL league football, so out of the um, out of the pre-season into the real stuff. He just hasn't seemed to be able to get away from his defender. Uh, he always... All of his opportunities, this is Brad Eddy, all of his opportunities seem to be with, uh, with the defender right hanging off him. Um, and so we're just not getting the value out of, his, uh, out of his spot, and so I don't have any qualms with the coaches going in a different direction. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, the times he did get off the chain, he did create some opportunities with that goal, uh, involvement in the first quarter, um, getting it over to Impey, and then he kicked the goal in the last. But yeah, in between that, he was rarely sided, which was, which was disappointing. But at the end of the day, I think we're a bit worried about their pace uh, along the ground, and, and we absolutely got tore up against... Uh, they tore it up against us in... Canberra last year and I think they're just a bit paranoid about that happening again so replacing him with a, a speedy player like Matty White but I just don't know what sort of form he's in, what sort of nicks in he hasn't played a game in two years, I mean is it going to take him a half a footy to, to get up to pace with it, Matthew White and I guess by that time it could be over and, and it just it's a bit of a worry and, and that the fact that we got that we got beat in the contest and contested footy last week, um, I would have thought we would have tried to sew up that contested inside game with bring, maybe bringing in an Atley or an Archie. Instead, you know, Amon keep their spot, Sam Gray keeps his spot, and we bring in another outside player. So they obviously back in those inside mids to, to bounce back against the Giants. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess I, I guess most people are expecting White not to play mostly on that um, that half odd feint, but it's hard to hard to argue with the the I guess the critique of Carl Lehman and Sam Gray. I think they can count themselves incredibly lucky that they weren't um, on the chopping block either. Um, particularly Carl Lehman, he's been he's been quiet and doesn't get a whole lot of time on the field. Um, so yeah, I think there's a couple of guys there that are uh, that have probably got their last. Um, opportunity this week to, to produce 
So do you think losing the contested footy last week was a concern, or is that just a a week where we we just underestimated the Crows mids and weren't able to match it with them for long enough? Uh, do you back us in this week to to bounce back and and match with the Giants, or do you think it's a problem? I don't see it as a huge problem. We won the first two weeks in contested possession, and we we did get beaten against the Crows. I mean, my perspective there was that we seem to allow the Crows to have extra numbers around the ball. And I don't know whether that was by design or by outworking. Um, it seemed to be by design because we seem to want to keep our our spare number behind the ball and not pushed up at the contest. And and what I felt like the Crows did was, was one of three weight of numbers uh, around the ball, as opposed to, um, as opposed to anything particularly sort of um, with individual players. So, It'll just be interesting to see how how that plays out. I don't think you can react after one week, given that we've won. Yeah, but look, we don't have a winning ruck this week, and we rely on a winning ruckman to get, you know, our fair share of hitouts to advantage. With a losing ruck, we needed, in my opinion, another inside player, and just it just worries me because the Giants are obviously so good in their hitouts to advantage. They've got the speed. They've got the, the contested types. For mine, I would have bring in another contested player um, and dropped one of those outsiders. But instead, we bring in outside player and Matt White kept Damon, and you know, pff, we just got to back in you know the the inside mids. But it it, it pff, we got absolutely smashed on the outside and inside against them last year. Yeah, it seemed to me like the where we fell down against the Crows in the showdown, and made, like I think the the ins kind of potentially speak to this is that we we just stopped moving and like you could, you could tell in the second quarter the guys were were pretty knackered and and our ball our kind of ball movement just completely fell to pieces because we couldn't uh like move the ball effectively from half back because the players weren't providing any lead up movement so you'd imagine a smaller like what i'm expecting to see from our team this week is a lot more movement um, up the field, creating options, and maybe some uh, like run run through the middle with handball and so forth. I think that we've got the, like the, the personnel that we've got is that's probably the way that we're looking to play this week. Yeah, I thought the I, I, you hit on a good point there. I thought the reason that we lost um, we lost control of the game wasn't necessarily because we lost control of the the midfield, even though we did. It was more the fact that we just we just completely started to panic in the back lines um, and the mid and the midfield options became static um, and we didn't um, we didn't slow the ball down we didn't just go hang on a sec let's just chip it around for a while and take the heat out of the game we were um, trying to play a pretty frenetic um, pretty frenetic style um, but without much thought I mean we just went back to the bombing it to the yep back to the defensive war as we did last year. I mean, we, I guess we're kind of hitting on the midfield battle here a bit. And James, you spoke about Jackson Trengove going in this week. He kind of takes the mantle back as the first ruck uh, with uh, Paddy Ryder on the pine for one week. Um, he, he obviously had a bit of a stint for about half of last season uh, playing the ruck. And Shane Mumford's kind of the most, phys- probably the most physical ruckman in the AFL. Uh, it's, a, and it's a clash of styles with the, Jackson Trengove, who's a bit more limber, um, so I mean, we might we might um, feel the pinch of the uh, no third man up rule a bit this week for the first time, really. Um, with it, with you know probably Trengove looking to get ragdolled a bit by by Mumford. So I mean, the chop out will come from Dixon and Westhoff. So you, like we're right, this is this is, this is a, a big concern going into this week. Yeah, definitely, and we are a good team with Ryder in there. As far as our center center bounce inside fifty, when when we when we do win those center bounces, we are the best team as as far as getting it inside fifty, and we do score a lot of goals from stoppage as well. So take out a rider, I don't know how we're going to sort of continue that good form, and and we do rely on a, a scoring a lot of goals from stoppage and. It's just a worry with with Trengo. I know he does a lot of good stuff when the ball hits the ground, but we have been really good with Ryder in there, and I just struggle to 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 see how we can continue that good form, especially at stoppage. 
Yeah, and you, like I mean, that's that's exactly right. And it's the only the most disappointing part is that we lose Ryder um, for something that we could control, and that, like, just poor discipline, really. And um, our network colleague Macca <laughs> had some thoughts to share about that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess where there's that kind of difference in playing style and physicality. I mean, as you said, Jimmy, like he does, he does some good work on the ground, and uh, he'll have to pull up, pick up a bit of slack in that regard this week. And uh, I don't know if you guys saw that a couple of weeks ago, where uh, Geelong actually pulled their ruckman um, in a couple of instances against North Melbourne. So they basically just um, let, yeah, let North. Like, and this is in general play. Just let the North Melbourne ruck kind of try and tap in it and send the ruckman to the to the fall of the ball. So. If you if you can kind of uh, sneak attack them with that once in a while, <laughs> or Tringo just stays down, um, that gives us an extra number perhaps around the ball. I just think um, uh, we uh, we shouldn't be unaccustomed to playing with Tringo. Obviously, we tr- we we ruck to him uh, for a good portion of last year, um, and it, it it fundamentally just comes down to the um, the inside midfielders coming with a a strong mindset, uh, make it a bit of a scrap. Um, mm. come, go go hard at the goal. The ball goes sensibly. Um, don't throw all of our numbers uh, in at the loose ball. Keep our um, sort of keep our structure around it, but go hard when it's your turn and um, and work from there. Um, I, I just don't think it should be something that we um, we should necessarily fear. Well, we've averaged seven goals a game from stoppage so far this year. So. We're creating seven goals a game from from a from a stoppage, and and that this this game, you know, with with Trangove and Dix, Dixon's been really good, and and if he could potentially create some opportunities when he's in there, that's only going to be a bonus. So, can you can you see us scoring seven goals this 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 week from from stoppage? Well, if, we play, remember- if we play smart, like we've got we've got um. We've got the players to do it, both uh, like the forwards who would who would attend a um, ball up in the forward line and the midfielders. Like you look at GWS, I know I cut you off there, Andrew. Um, like GWS got Shield, Callum Ward, Scully, and Josh Kelly, but not much outside of that. There's a, there's a couple of lesser lights in there in like the second year academy players. I think we bat far deeper than them, and you throw in like a power pepper. Like we've got, we've actually got some players that, as far as like the on-ground midfielders, um, I, I realise, you know, we, we were probably rucking, uh, playing to a losing ruckman, but uh, we've got the quality in the midfield, and uh, I would hope that we dominate around stoppages. I just don't. Um, whilst it's that that cle- that goals from clearance or goals from stoppage is an, is an interesting stat, and obviously if we're leading the league, we're doing something well. But it's not sort of like the Brendan Laid to Sean Burgoyne running into an open goal. I don't remember too many of those. Um, and so I think it speaks more to the quality of how well our inside midfield has played, particularly in the first two weeks. Like Ollie Wines, like he creates opportunities mm. for himself. Um, Brad Ebert, um, uh, Sam Pell Pepper, Boak when he goes in there, uh, Robbie Gray um, had a purple patch last week um, around, the, around the stoppages as well. So... I don't, I don't think it's necessarily reliant on uh, on Ryder putting it on putting uh, it on a plate to them. And, and I guess last week I thought um, to, to to see the future a little bit. I didn't think I didn't think Ryder produced anything last week that was um, um, any different to what I would expect Trengo. I thought he was really disappointing in his placement of of his taps when he did get his hand to the ball and he dominated the hitouts. But we didn't see any any benefit from that. So uh, I, I tend to put more play on on how those um, on how the midfielders work together um, and together with the Rutman um, to, to see that success on the flip side the, the, the Giants are the number one team for hitouts to advantage and they get a 30 percent rate in that department and <laughs> they're able to score on 28 percent of their stoppage which is second so we might be the best team but they're the second best team as far as scoring from stoppage, and they also have the number one ruckman with hitouts to advantage. So, I mean, are we are we in a position this year at the at three games into the year? Like, is the sam- is the sample size too small to read any read into anything? Because that thirty percent hitout to advantage, I think, is like the hitout to advantage stat is quite um, is normally significantly lower than that over the sort of AFL average. 
um, it may be just that we're we're still early in the season, and some of these trends will um, will need to play yeah. themselves a bit more. Well, let's 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 hope they revert to the main this week. And uh, yeah, um, uh, you met, we mentioned uh, Travis Burke there, and uh, he actually becomes the longest serving AFL Port Adelaide captain this week, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, what a champion! Absolutely. Well. Um, I mean, a couple of guys, names we haven't actually mentioned for GWS are uh, Heath Shaw, Zach Williams, and uh, Nathan Wilson. Uh, we, we touched on kind of the inside 50 action, but I mean, the GWS get a lot of their rebound from those players. Um, so what can we do potentially to stifle those guys? I think that um, one of those things you, that goes a bit under the radar, I think Sam Gray did a bit of a job on Rory Laird last week. So do we have to put any... We don't have any Angus Mulfries this week, so... Uh, do we have to put a bit of work into one or two of those guys? Oh, for sure. And, you know, Jarman Impey's tackling is important. Sam Gray has to earn his spot, keep tackling hard, keep creating turnovers. we just got to make him turn it over. I mean, when we get it in quick, we look dangerous. And that small fleet, in particular, need to produce with, with pressure acts and, and tackling and creating stoppages and and stop them getting it out and running it down because we saw last week what happens when we score a point you know they the opposition kick a goal and it's a 12 point turnaround and we just can't let that happen this week and it really hurts us so it's up to those small forwards in particular to really put pressure on the ball carriers and and make them kick a, a kick under pressure and and if if they start getting off the leash they're very dangerous off half back I don't know who's going to play that Angus Monfrey's role because he's done it better than anyone in the past and especially getting under Heath Shaw's skin. I remember him playing against him in the Collingwood final in 2013. He's really got a knack of getting under his skin and getting in his head. So maybe Aaron Young plays that role this week. Um, I don't know. who Who's that antagonised type we've got? I don't think there is someone like that in the team anymore. So... It just depends. We can't let him get off the leash because he's an all-Australian type player when he's playing at his at his peak. Organism is the critical thing. I think it's the having someone on him that makes him accountable and uh, makes him earn his touches. And um, I know that uh, watching one of the videos from the club during the week, Brendan Laid sort of said that they sent uh, Aaron Young to Brody um, Smith uh, at half time and they were really pleased with the job that he did despite the fact that he was a bit limited with his shoulder uh, he uh, he really shut him down so I'd uh, I'd back Young in for a role like that I mean on Heath Shaw like he is good for a 50 metre penalty or you know <laughs> if you if can kind of uh, ruffle his feathers so you know maybe Young should take a leaf from Sam Pal Pepper and give him a bum tap or something after uh, yeah remember those after, two that's kicking a goal on him two goals he gave away in 2013 final for Collingwood, Montfries, it's perfect. Like just get in his head, do something stupid, and we kick two goals in a second. It was fantastic. Yeah, more of that this week. Let's <laughs> hope. Well, guys, um, I think we've kind of we've spoken to most of the uh, you know the field, if you like. We haven't we haven't done any deep dives on say the interchange bench, but uh, that's fine. Um, We'll, finish, we'll wrap it up with our six pointers. And uh, as usual, folks, if you don't listen in regularly, this is where we make some predictions about how the game's going to unfold. You can keep an eye on it. And uh, yeah. So, best on ground by Super Coach Points, Jimmy. Ollie Wines. Uh, Brad Ebert. Yes, two guys in very fine form. And Ollie Wines leading the. AFL Coaches Association award, is it, at this point in time? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, only, the only award that matters, isn't it? Yes, it's one of the only awards that matter. What about okay. the, the Advertiser Merv Agnes medal? That's oh, pretty yes. important. That is the, um, the medal of medals. Okay, leading goal kicker, Andrew, who are you taking? Uh, I'm going to go with Robbie Gray. Not bad, not bad. I'll take Chad Wingard. Yes, let's hope that uh, we have a few multiple goal kickers this week. Um, I'm calling this the Michael Pettigrew Memorial Challenge. <laughs> oh, uh, Shane Mumford over under 36 hit outs. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, over. 
Uh, I'll go second. Can I go over as well? There's absolutely no <laughs> chance he gets under 36 and <laughs> I just wanted to give Pettigrew a shout out. Um, but I realised that under's probably set, set a bit low. I mean, who else could we pick? The Nathan Cracker um, challenge? 47? Is he 47? He only had, thir- he had 33 last week against the North Melbourne Ruckman, so you never know. Okay, um, how familiar are you guys with the University of New South Wales, Canberra, Oval, and its capacity? No, uh, very not. <laughs> um, Andrew, uh, well, on that note, give us, give us a crack at uh, the crowd figure over uh, in the six, nation's capital. Six and a half thousand. Six and a half. Does that include cars on the hill? <laughs> no, um, I'll go, yeah, seven and a half. Yeah, I mean, bloody hell, how many times do they play footy in uh, in Canberra this year? Like, get along, uh, public servants and, uh, you know, diplomats. Go and check out the footy. Go and see the uh, Port Adelaide Football Club established in 1870. And speaking of the Port Adelaide Football Club... Give us your margin and tip for this week's matchup, Jimmy. Why don't you kick this one off? Yeah, I just, I don't know. It's 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 tough to see us winning. Um, so I'm going to have to take Port by nine points. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, the GWS by uh, seventeen points. Okay, I took a lot of took, took a little a bit of heart out of last week. Obviously, we didn't get the result that we wanted, but um, I think we're beginning to show, and I'm starting to get back to the point where I think we're a genuine shot to win every game. Um, that I mean, that said, I'm taking GWS by 25 points. <laughs> but if if we, uh, I think, um, and I don't think you could say this last couple of years. I think we're going to give every team. Um, a fright this year and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we walk away with the points um, you know this, I think we're one of the things that came out was it Brad Abbott during the week well, it might have been Jackson Chingrove talking about how they, you know they've uh, they were really dirty about 2015 and 16 and they're, they're putting it you know they, they want to bring the pride back to you know this this playing outfit because um, they they really dropped the ball over the last couple of years and I, I think they're living up to that. Um, this, we're still not a uh, you know we still haven't perfectly cleaned everything up and we saw that last week. You spoke about those twelve point turnarounds. I think we had we had more of those last week than in living memory in a particular game. Um, but I think when we play, you know, to our to our potential, we can we can bet anyone. And that includes the uh, the premiership favourites at this point. Yeah, absolutely, and we're starting to get back some self-belief and, and gain a little bit of respect back from the competition and the, the general football public, which has been pleasing, but it's still very early in the season. We know what happens when we start getting ahead of ourselves, so again, we've got to back ourselves in and, and you know, like bring that mentality like it's round one, like it's we're playing out of our skins. We have to bring it every week. We can't just take the foot off the gas and expect things to happen. And we've got to make things happen. And this is an opportunity to get four points. And we just can't let ourselves down. We took the foot off the gas so many times in the last couple of years. And we get blown out. And, and look, it's one step forward, two steps back. And this year, we just can't afford to do that. And I, and I have faith that if we play the right brand of footy and, and back ourselves in, play as a team, um, Port Adelaide can do anything, mate. And I, I truly believe this team and this squad has got the uh, potential to do good things, great things even. So uh, just play that Port Adelaide footy and we can do it, I believe. Thanks, Jess. Andrew. G- Andrew, do you have a uh, inspirational? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, Jimmy and I—we're trying to pump the boys up here. What, do you, what have you got for us? Uh, you don't score until you score. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. For that. Uh, that was that is not the culmination of this podcast that we were looking for. <laughs> but uh, no, good podcast, guys. Um, we've uh, we've definitely uh, talked about football for approximately forty-five minutes. So. Uh, looking forward to uh, you know this weekend of footy. It's all, it's uh, a good weekend to uh, you know have a bit of downtime, spend some time with friends and family, and 
you know, watching footy. There's uh, there's footy all across the weekend, so let's enjoy it. And, and most particularly, let's hope the, the power grabber wins. So, folks, you'll be able to you'll be able to hear the reviews from the Port Fam Radio Network uh, after the game in the coming days. So keep an eye out for those. And as always, if you're enjoying our work, the number one way to support us, aside from listening to us is to give us a, uh, a nice review on iTunes. So if you can, you can drop us five stars and some kind words, that that is hugely appreciated. So spread the word that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and hit us up on the message boards, on the Facebooks, on the Twitters, and just come, just say hello. I, was, I just want to add one thing. If anyone's listening out there that's having any any mental health problems, any issues like that, don't be afraid to speak to someone. Life's too short to bottle up your emotions, and people are there to listen, so just ask. If you need help, just ask, and people will be there for you. Uh, very well said, James. It's, uh, it's a, uh, something that impacts, uh, impacts everyone um, in varying different ways, and everyone knows someone that's, uh, that's going through a tough trot, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Bloody oath. Right, guys. Thanks, thanks for uh, for uh, chipping in this weekend, guys, and uh, let's enjoy the game on the weekend. Go the power! Outports. Go the power. <laughs>